Ah, uh, stop it. So, perhaps in the end, so if you're still awake. Um, so every year I have to drag Jakob, Jakob out of here, so he's not voluntarily coming, so he's a recluse, even though he just lives a couple of hours apart, uh, away from here. So uh, we're trying to get you to be more interested in the compiler side and so on. And uh, last year we already had to talk on compilers a little bit and so on, talking about optimization, etc. So this time it's a little bit different, so we're touching the same topic a little bit, but it's mostly about how do you actually, well, how can you actually peek into the compiler? How can you actually see what is going on and understand this? Because believe it or not, if you're invoking GCC or G++ and sinus this, that's not a monolithic thing. There's all kinds of things going on in the background when this is, and hopefully after this talk, you will be able to actually if something goes wrong or if it, it doesn't work exactly as you do, so you actually are able to peek into some of these kind of details. And this is also something which is dear to our heart and so on, give us, when something goes wrong, actually much better feedback on what is going on. So, yeah. Can you move the quiz again? It's there so well. It worked before, so. Okay, let's switch on the clock, maybe. No. Okay, otherwise it's just do it like this. It worked before, yeah. But it's it's not actually even moving. Is it Page up, page down. Oh no, it doesn't. There, there you have it. No, it's not doing anything. <coughs> okay. Yes. So, uh, yeah, just stating quite obvious that compiler is, is a real, very large program that, that does a lot of things and it's quite hard to understand what, what each part of the compiler does and how it fits together. So this is just a small picture of, of the general, general sequence of, of things which, which are done during compilation. We take the source code, then there, there is a front end. We have, uh, GCC has multiple front ends, so C, C++, D, Ada, uh, Go, and, and many others. And uh, they transform the source code into something that, uh, something, uh, that the middle end then can use. And, and then there is a generic code which handles well, inputs from all the front ends and optimizes the, that. And then the code generator is, is actually another uh, intermediate layer, uh, another language which describes closer uh, the machine, machine code, which is specific to the, each, each of the uh, backends we, we support, so like 386 or AR64 and other, other architectures. And uh, GCC emits uh, assembly as, as a text file. Other compilers sometimes emit uh, directly uh, the object file or binary. Uh, GCC does not. And GCC emits a uh, text file that needs to be assembled by another program, usually the GNU assembler. And, uh, what this produces is an object file which is then linked by the linker and then, then can be actually executed. So this is the architecture which compilers like Jesus here, but also Clang is following. So this doesn't mean every compiler has to look like this. And you will often find people then, so if you're looking at things uh, sites like Hacken, you say, oh, my compiler is 100 times faster than GCC. Well, but they don't implement basically the same thing. So as Jakob mentioned and so on, for instance, we need to have the clear separation of the front end and the middle end because we want to support multiple languages there. 
which also means that we need to find a representation of the program which is independent of the front, or mostly independent of the front end, as it is emitted to the middle end, to the optimizers and so on. So, and the same is then also true for, for the back end. So because we are targeting, I don't know how many of these are, 50, 60, 100 different architectures, CPU architectures, which we can target with the same compiler, there needs to be an interface between the optimizing the middle end and so on, the optimizers and so on, and the back end, the code generator, which is uh, generic enough so that it actually can target all the different architectures and so on. If you are writing a C compiler which only targets, let's say, X86 or ARM or something like this, I can write something which is 100 times faster than GCC. But that's not the same beast. It's something much more simple. And then all these kind of things, these individual steps we just seen, they can be merged together and they can be skipped and they can be optimized, etc. So we are, don't, don't forget this. This is something which is oftentimes a critique, but it's completely invalid, given the goal GCC has. Well, different compilers can have different goals, and if compile time is, nice is, is, is the most important can, can goal, the then, then of course it might generate slower code, but might be much faster. Uh, so uh, for C and C++, we actually have a preprocessor there as well, uh, which we'll talk later about. And the preprocessor uh, does the uh, preprocessing phase uh, uh, described in, in the, those two standards. Uh, in the past, like 15 years ago, GCC had a separate program which, which did the preprocessing and then uh, pipe that to, uh, into, into, uh, into the C compiler. Uh, that's not done anymore. Uh, if, if you want, you can uh, pre-process separately and then, then compile it again. But unfortunately, it loses some information, like, for instance, we have uh, some warnings which depend on, um, on uh, comments in the source code and those are gone uh, through the pre-processing. Yeah, and uh, there are other things there we can do what is called pre-compiled headers, which also shortcuts some of these kind of things. It can do, it does, means that some of the system resources, which you see there at the top, they don't necessarily have to come in, in textual form. They can come in in some kind of binary form, which can speed up compilation significantly for a large projects, specifically C++ projects. And for those who are, of course, every one of you is following the C++ standard process and so on and knows that in 2020 we will get modules in C++. So they will also, of course, be implemented and basically at the front end and side, where instead of injecting the, uh, the system resources and even the resources of other projects and so on in textual form, they will now come in this module form, which has most likely will have some form of binary representation. Those are already mostly implemented in GCC, but on the side branch, it hasn't been merged, unlike coroutines, for instance. So it will be next year that it will make it in. And then with, with modules, there are, there are some issues like for, for make dependencies and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, so uh, this, this picture also shows that uh, what, what we do with, with LTO, which, which is uh, link time optimization, in which we are able to uh, look at the whole program or whole shared library and analyze it and optimize it even more. Uh, what we actually do is, is the front end emits some, uh, some intermediate language, which is then optimized by, by like, 70 uh, different early optimizers, uh, optimizer passes. And then we uh, store also information about different uh, uh, attributes of the functions which, which we are storing and store everything into, uh, into the object files. And then later at linker time, uh, we can read it again and, and see the whole picture and split it into small partitions, which we then actually compile and then run further uh, 150 optimizations or how many. So we'll see a little bit later on how the process is involved and then we go into the, some of the more details because there you can actually see this. So if you're thinking about 
the process here in general works on what is called a compile unit level. Every single input file, this .cc file or .c file and so on, is individually handled, and for each of them it produces an object file. Even if the compiler is given on the com command line multiple CC files, they're individually handled. So this can be uh, a problem when it comes to highest optimization levels because you might want to have cross compiled unit of optimizations happening and this is where then, for instance, LTO comes in. So we will go as said later on, we have a little bit more on that. This just shows that there are some, some points where, where there are some interfaces between different kind of uh, intermediate language. Uh, the interfaces are unfortunately not very clean. There is a way, for instance, that the middle end can call language hooks and ask some properties from the, uh, ask some questions to the front end. But the, uh, these are usually done before the LTO is, is, is written because then it can come from many different languages. And on the other side, uh, there are target hooks, callbacks, which, which uh, provide uh, machine-specific information already in the middle end, yeah. so can change different things in, in the... Uh, so when all the compiler engineers amongst you, so I guess half of you, uh, will be able to actually extend the compiler specifically at these kind of interfaces. If something completely new comes on, theoretically, yes, you can do all kinds of things there. So you can replace pieces there and so on as long as you follow the interfaces that's there. So it's at least, as Jakob said, it's not 100% clean in the moment and so on. So if someone really wanted to and wants to invest the time, perhaps we can do this. But at least these are, there's, the interfaces are, are attempted to be kept at the minimum and so on, and so you can actually implement something there. So for instance, the D front end was just recently added in there. This was possible because, well, there's a fixed interface, a more or less fixed interface to the middle end. And we have a couple of more coming in. So I think yeah, Pascal, the modular, modular, modular 2 and so on, and might, might want to come in sometime soon, et cetera. So, Okay, so this shows uh, what kind of processes are run when, when you actually run the G++ program. Uh, as you can see, G++ is, is not the actual compiler. It's, it's a compiler driver that calls other processes and creates temporary files and stuff like that. So at all these triple dots and so on, I abbreviated this. This is a lengthy path somewhere. You are not supposed to care about what it actually means in, in practice and so on. It's, but it, what I left is the nine there. My, comp my computer had GCC nine version. You can have multiple different compilers installed on your machine and actually, well, in more or less can re uh, work with them at the same time in the same installation. But they're all hidden somewhere in some deep hierarchy which you should not care about. And, and the compiler is also written in a way that it's relocatable package, so if you store it in, in some other path, then it should be able to find the files uh, in the relative path uh, against uh, the compiler driver. So uh, here we see that if we, if we, uh, if we try to compile a project with two C++ sources, uh, the driver actually runs first the compiler. In the past, it would run first the preprocessor pre and store it either in a file or, or pipe it into, into the compiler. CC1 plus is the compiler. And it's called with, with the first source and produces a, an assembly somewhere in, in the temp directory. Then uh, we invoke the assembler and assemble that in, into an object file. Uh, one can use the minus pipe option for the driver and then instead of using the temporary files, it it's pipes it in, into, pipes the output of the compiler into the assemble, assembler. Can do, so there, 
things which you notice here, as I said, as Jakob said, so the preprocessor is not run anymore as it used to be, but you can still get to this, and we are uh, sure we're going to show this. Uh, what you see here is that the com uh, compiler, CC1+, plus, outputs a file with dot as lowercase s as the output. So that's not, not, a, not something that's deliberately a, a file extension here. Lowercase s in the GC terminology, at the very least, means that is an assembly file which doesn't need preprocessing. If you're writing assembly by hand, you're supposed to use a capital S, which means uh, assembly code which requires preprocessing. In most cases, this is the case. And the compiler driver, GCC or G++ and so on, knows about these, these extensions. And it also knows about the extensions which we used to use before we had the, the integrated preprocessor. It has an extension lowercase i. That's preprocessed C code. Or dot .ii, preprocessed C++ code. And you can still use this today as well. If you do that and you have them on the G++ command line, dot .i and dot .ii files and so on, the compiler still knows how to handle these kind of files. The other thing to point out here is that if you have large projects, many, many files to compile, it is a bad idea to invoke the compiler once with all its files on the command line. Why? You don't get multiprocessing. If you want to have, if you, nowadays we have multi-core machines, so my machine at home has 30-something cores and so on. I want to actually run the G++ or GCC driver multiple times in parallel to get compilation happening at the same time. So don't do it like in this example with multiple files on the same command line. And another reason is if you change just, just one of those files, then you unnecessarily recompile the other one, which has not changed. Well, make has an option which says only put that, those yeah. files which actually changed on the command line, but still it's a bad idea. Don't ever do this. Have a separate rule for every single input file. So collect2 is, is just a wrapper around the linker. Uh, on Linux, that's mostly yeah. useless. It's it's especially for some weird architectures. Well, yeah, it's not like, a, well, it I used ex, to be yeah. very important in it, the it, past. It did something when, when the uh, linker itself did not Yeah, well, or in architecture. So the GCC can be handled on proprietary architectures as well, at which point uh, we don't have control over the linker. We might have to work around idiosyncrasies or failures or bugs or whatever in the linker and collect to allows us to do these kind of things. Again, GCC is a compiler which is not just modular in, in the way it's structured, but also a compiler which can be, hand, uh, can be used on all kinds of architectures. So nowadays we don't use any of the proprietary Unixes anymore, but back in the days and so on, we had, we had uh, SunOS, uh, Solaris, we had uh, Altrix and so on. But the unifying thing is that on all of them we use GCC. And for all of them, we are, unless we were able to use the GNU LD as the linker there as well, we used the system linker. The system linkers were not uniform. We had to work around limitations. And this is how Collect2 came into being. Yeah, Collect2 can do stuff like uh, parse the message, uh, error messages of the linker. And if some symbol is not defined, then instruct the compiler again to, to compile something in, in some ways of, of uh, C++ compilation, which are these days not used, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this just shows that uh, in the dis distribution, yeah, I think by default is, is Ccache installed, and that's, that's another program which, which, which is early in the search path and, and actually Remembers the preprocessed source of, of uh, which which has been have been compiled already in the past and just uh, avoids compilation is something that has been uh, has not changed. Yeah, so quite this uh, I specifically also this is here on the slides because uh, it actually <coughs> requires a lot of knowledge of the compiler in the, which it, which it invokes. And every once in a while, there is something which breaks C cache, where 
the, the assumptions it makes about the compiler are not valid anymore, and then you have to directly invoke perhaps GCC or G++ and so on to actually do the compilation yourself. So, but most people really have no idea that this is actually going on, that when they're typing in GCC, they are not actually getting the GCC from GCC package, but getting the GCC from Ccache. Uh, Ccache actually does the pre-processing separately and then, then uh, gives that to the compiler, so that's, that's an issue with the lost warnings and, and uh, exact locations and stuff like that. Uh, there is a way how to do it in, uh, in GCC, like we have F directive on, directives only option, which uh, kind of does a limited kind of pre-processing just merges the files which are included and does nothing else. But Ccache actually does not use that option, unfortunately. So if you invoke uh, the compiler driver with minus V, you can see a lot of details about many things. Yeah, so there's tons of text which is coming out there, as you can see. Um, much of it for the normal just user is not really that interesting perhaps. There are a couple of things which are, which should be at least. So for instance, uh, look at the lower uh, markings which I, which I added there basically. These are the path that the compiler is looking at first before it looks somewhere else. So before it actually normally would assume, well, yeah, it looks into user include. Well, but there are actually a couple of directories it looks at first for various reasons. We have things like uh, offloading, so offload compilation and so on, which we're talking about later on. Well, which of the targets are available? You can look at this only from this input. So normally this is not something a compiler ad ad advertises in any other way. So this kind of information is there. And for if you want to replicate the compiler, so you might want to compile it yourself because you might want to want poke in these kind of things. So uh, either you have to be Jakob and know this by heart and so on, because he actually selects these kind of things, or you look at, when you see the second highlight at that part, it actually shows you exactly how to replicate the compiler. You get out the appropriate source code, and that's the command, command line for the configure script to actually get this and then compile. So it helps you to get to all this kind of information. That's just one of the screens. And then it shows the exact command lines of the different processes it runs. So there is the CC1 command line in there, which shows how, how it compiles the C file. And then later on, there will be somewhere the assembler. Yeah, the assembler is there. So uh, here it's CC, that's the C code. CC is the C compiler. CC1 plus is the C++ compiler. And uh, one, one, for instance, th these command lines are useful when one uses, for instance, minus safe temps option, which, which doesn't use uh, uh, random, random temporary files which are immediately removed, but actually keeps them on the file system. And then you can just cut and paste those command lines and run them by hand and change something and, and so on. So uh, LTO is, is as, as we said before, is, is the link time optimizations where, where the compiler can see the whole picture. And it's something that's going to be enabled next week in, in Fedora. So, <laughs> so for the entire distribution. <laughs> so that's a big thing. Well, probably we'll have to opt out on, for a couple of packages. Either they use inline assembly in a way that incompatible with, with LTO or there can be other issues, but, or we, we will see uh, how, how well uh, it works on, on the 32-bit architectures if for larger, uh, larger compilations it, it actually fits into the available RAM uh, on the yeah, builders. Yeah, made strides there, so you can compile Firefox with LTO and it still works on a decently sized machine, so. And, and SUSE actually switched to LTO by default last year, and so they have already some experience. And we are trying to gain it as well. So you, you can see, so we, we mentioned LTO is something which is happening, as the name suggests, at link time. So, so, so the first, uh, 
the first part is, is basically the same as, as, as on the previous picture uh, slide. And the only difference is, is actually just passing the minus plugin option uh, to the linker and passing FLTO. And that's basically it. And the linker has a system of plugins where if, uh, if the linker sees specific uh, sections in the object files which, which the plugin is interested in, then it uh, invokes uh, some callbacks in the plugin and lets them handle it and pass, pass back some object file which, which should replace Something. So, and when we say that the first part is pretty much the same, the, there's one change which is not visible here, but which uh, Jakob already mentioned. There is additional information emitted into every single object file. So basically the intermediate representation of all the code of the compilation unit, in addition to the normal code, the normal generated assembly code for, 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 the, for the module, the intermediate representation is also part of the uh, of the object file. Well, there are actually two modes of LTO. One, one is the slim one, which actually omits, uh, emits just, just the just LTO object file, uh, just the LTO uh, uh, data and, and not actually as assembly and just emits the symbols and that's it. And that has the ad uh, disadvantage. Uh, well, that's, that's something, for instance, in the distribution we can't easily use because, uh, for instance, for static libraries, we want to strip the LTO stuff from them because it's dependent on, on the exact compiler version. And AB ship the static libraries, we don't want them, uh, don't want to recompile them every time we change the compiler. So, uh, so we emit the fat uh, LTO by uh, default in the distribution, which is which includes both the assembly. So if you ignore the, if you don't invoke the linker driver and just throw throw the data away, then it will link normally in uh, as as if you didn't compile LTO at all. But if the linker uh, plugin kicks in and optimizes it some, somehow, then then the normal assembly can be completely ignored and, and replaced by something later on. So the linker wrapper uh, spawns a LTO wrapper program. The weird syntax with, with, the, uh, with the at symbol at the start is, is, is a way how to store multiple options in, in a text file. So that temporary file includes many, many options which are not listed there. And uh, the LTO wrapper invokes again the compiler driver, again passes some options, and the sources uh, the, the driver tries to compile are actually not the normal source files, but are the object files, and, and it's instructed to use it as LTO, so reads the, uh, from the object files the data and, and tries to compile it. So, yeah. So the LTO1 is the equivalent of CC1 or CC1 plus. But in this case, we don't need to differentiate between the languages anymore. As we said before, the intermediate representation, once we are out of the front end, is independent of the language, mostly independent of the language. So we have this as a, as a, uh, as a way for unifying this process, and we only have to make sure that LTO1 can handle all the object code, which is why the intermediate representation, which is part of the object file there. So, and, uh, so in this case, it's, it's done in two steps. You see there for each of the uh, input files. So uh, yeah, yeah, the first phase is the WPA, and that's the phase uh, which, uh, where the compiler sees all the objects at, at once and uh, because the um, program could be extremely large, it uh, really can't uh, read all the bodies of all the functions and stuff like that. So it parses mostly just summary information from it and decides uh, 
also based on, on command line options, how many uh, partitions it will use. Uh, and partition is, is uh, some, some code which, which is related and which needs to be compiled together to be uh, beneficial. And, and then splits, splits the uh, data from, from the input object files into other object files, uh, which are then feeded to, to the next uh, LT01. And uh, then the second step is, is basically done once per partition. So there can be many partitions. If, if it's a very large project, this, this is a very small project. So it has just one partition. And uh, the LTO wrapper can actually even invoke make and ask make to uh, handle the spawning of the G++ processes to, to run the compilation of the different partitions uh, can even ask if it's invoked from, from some upper make file, like the up, uh, upper uh, GCC driver is invoked from a make, uh, which is paralyzed. And so it can talk to that make and, uh, and work together how to, how to split it uh, yeah. on a multiprocessor. So this only works with GNU make, which can act as a server. And, so, and there needs to be some plus in, in from yeah. the command. So there, there, there are ways how, how you can handle these kind of things. But so let, let's get a couple of examples. What, what is actually, where is LTO actually worth all this trouble? So you have all kinds of additional processes which are going on. So imagine that you have compile units, you're calling one function from another one, especially if it's C++ code, you have things like template functions, et cetera, and so on. And oftentimes, you get told also to write very small functions, which means the function call overhead might actually be larger than what the function does by itself. This is an optimization which is countering that, which is very frequent, it's called inlining. It actually takes the function definition and puts it in place of where the function would be used. Well, if you compile this normal way with individual compile units, this cannot happen because the definition and the uh, use might not be in the same compile unit. Well, uh, it depends. If you place yeah. those small, small, uh, uh, small functions into header files, then yeah, yeah, in, in header files. But if they are not, if they are in, in if, different if are compile else, units, then you don't have this as a possibility. And LTO works around that as one of the possible things. It actually sees, as Jakob said at the beginning, the whole program at some point. And it can make decisions. Oh, yeah, that function is actually a candidate of being inlined. And this happens automatically. So otherwise, before there was link time optimization, whole program optimization, and so on, developers, if they wanted to, they had to carefully design things with header files and other things to actually make sure that they get exactly the kind of program layout and optimization is going to happen. With LTO, this is not. And given that the, the actually the, uh, the main efforts in programming now, this is really to get the program done in the first place because and only optimize it if there's really the, the, the need or the possibility actually doing this. It's a second thought most of the time. So having LTO actually doing these kind of things for you is a big, big win, and this is why we're enabling it for the entire distribution. Uh, there are many other things it can do, like it can find out that all the colors of some function, which is in some other uh, translation unit, for instance, have some range uh, for, for integer values, and it can propagate that range into the function and optimize it. Yeah. And, and you can see this in the generated code. You have function names, and some of them, somewhere in the name, they appears then clone. If this is the case, then this kind of optimization kicked in. It can have all kinds of forms. It's range propagation. It can be also, it, the function is always invoked with two as the second parameter. Yeah, so that's constant propagation in there. Uh, we can also optimize on the value returned from function. If, if we find out this function returns only this value or only this range or, or, and, and so on. Or uh, for instance, some functions take a structure but actually use just a single member from, from that structure. So in that case, we can change the calling convention and pass just the element and, and many other things. 
or return just one element. So there are all kinds of things which can go on. So LTO is a big thing. So yeah, it adds cost, but it's worth it in most cases, hopefully. And it's especially worth when, when you combine it with, with the profile guided optimizations where you actually compile instrument the program, uh, then run it on some benchmark or something which uh, no, represented represents workload. the normal usage. And then you compile it again with, with this gathered data, how, how, many uh, how many times some function has been called or how many times some if statement decided to go to this branch and, and so on. How many, how many iterations some loop had. Yeah, so if you're writing code, make sure that your production code is using LTO actually. You should not use it in the normal development cycle because additional work. But whenever you're coming to the point that you actually want to see how the program perhaps behaves in production, how the production code would work, then turn it on and compile it this way. Yeah, it should uh, not change the semantic. With, with, uh, with the FAT uh, LTO, it actually d at least doubles the compile time because it needs to compile everything normally and then do the LTO compilation. With, with I don't, didn't quite get so that. So if you're passing, say, dash O2 or O3 into GCC, yeah. and a lot of that's happening at the compiler stage, not the link stage, is it worth throwing those optimizations away for the extra the quick compile time? It completely depends there as well. So the, uh, the, even with LTO and so on, so there, there's some optimizations which are still are already carried on and so on. But the thing, you, your question is in a completely different direction. How do you get the highest compile speed and so on? Obviously, if you're not doing any optimizations and so on, you're not wasting any time on, uh, on, on, on these phases of compiler. But quite honestly, so I'm not sure. I haven't done the, the experiment recently, so, but tw about 20 years ago, so I did the experiment with compiling something with uh, just without dash O, any kind of optimization, and with a one. And the difference in sizes of the generated code without optimization in many cases are negating the effects. Because with O1, you at least get some simple optimization which is going on, which can in some cases reduce the size of the assembly file and the entire tree representation so dramatically that you actually get this. So it might today be different. So back in those days, disks were much, much slower and so on. Maybe we're, we're over that point today. So it would be interesting to get this. But I almost never compile without a minimum level of optimization. The only reason why you want to skip perhaps optimization is if you're losing debug information and so on or getting this. But we have, I don't know how many years or 10 years, we have OG now for a long, long time. Put in OG. If I use OG, I still have a, a GDB error that the variable optimized our Yes, that, that can happen. Uh, but uh, It's well, getting better. Well, OG, OG has some advantage for, for debug info over O0 o and, 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 and uh, other disadvantages. So, uh, uh, we, we, we have a plan for OG to also try to artificially use all the variables at the end of, of their scope, which, which would uh, make sure they are not sure left. They, they are left yeah. But theoretically, the dwarf debug information could represent these kind of things. And Alex Oliver, who unfortunately left us for another opportunity this last year, and so on, he was working on many of these kind of things. And I think he still continues to work on some of these actors to actually make the debug information generation much more efficient. So we are, we ha well, we actually haven't have, don't have this on these slides. So just to give you an impression why this is so difficult and so on. An optimizer itself. So we're, we're not really talking about this at the beginning slide. You saw this block optimizers. These are actually many, many different optimizers. So Jakub mentioned something like 50, opt uh, 50, 70 blocks are for the LTO, and then another 150 for the backend, and so on for the generations. So these individual steps which you are going to do. So a couple more slides on that later, and so on. But every single transformation is transforming the code tree, the code representation, to maintain the debug information, a format that the debugger can have this. We actually have to do two transformations. 
the code transformation and the debug information transformation at the same time and in sync, and that's difficult. This is why we are losing some of this information. In many cases, the compiler simply pessimizes this and says, uh, I give up, I don't do anything about this variable anymore. And, and we have also the self-imposed uh, requirement that we don't want minus G to change uh, the generated right. code. So it just needs to add the debug information but not, should not change the generated code. So that if you compile without minus G and later on find out I need to debug this, you should be able to do using the same. And, and before you complain, the compilers we had up to the mid 90s, the other compilers except for GCC, either allowed you to use dash G or optimization. Pick one. So GCC is much better. So uh, offloading is another. Uh, another thing which, which recently is getting uh, much more important. And that's because we have all those uh, different GPGPUs and, and other, uh, other hardware which can actually do stuff much faster uh, at the parallel level than, than the main CPU. So in, uh, in C and C++, Fortran, there are various extensions which allow you to write uh, code that uses the uh, offloading hardware. Explicitly. Yeah. So one of them is OpenMP, OpenACC is another standard, and there are other ways how to, how to do it, CUDA and whatever. And so when, when GCC is involved in a program which includes some some offloading code in, written in OpenMP or OpenACC pragmas, then again, we have the same, same first commands as, as during normal compilation, except we pass an extra option somewhere. And the new thing is, again, done from the linker. Uh, well, during the compilation, we already store uh, store again in the LTO format, but in different sections, uh, the functions which, which are intended to be uh, offloaded. And then the compiler can have different uh, offloading backends. One of them is NVPTX for, for the NVIDIA devices. Uh, in GCC 10, we have also the GCN backend for AMD. And there is HSAIL, uh, which is also for AMD, but, uh, but and it's a virtual um, assembly code, which is then compiled. Could theoretically it. target others. So it's not in the moment. Yeah, there is, there is some emulator as well, which emulates it just on the host in, in different processes. So the difference here is, as Jakob mentioned, you might not have picked up on the slight nuance there, is that we are not emitting the entire program as intermediate representation to the object file. Only the specific functions which are meant to be offloaded to be accelerated. And variables too. Yeah, and so this is slightly more efficient when it comes to compilation time and so on, but of course very specific and you have to make, well, a compiler has to make the right decisions about what to offload and what not. And then one can either use the default, which, which is when you don't specify it, just, just use OpenMP uh, to, to enable the language extensions, or you can use minus F offload equals something and, and many options and then choose exactly I want this offloader or I want to pass these options to that offloader and, and so on. And, do you and so this, this shows just a single offloader to NVPTX. Uh, but you can also potentially have the same program being ready for multiple offload targets. The same program and it will at runtime use the appropriate one. What basically happens is, is that uh, the linker plugin creates a fat, fat binary which contains the main program and some data, a special data section which contains for each offloading target some binary, binary or, or text block. It, it depends on, for NVPTX it's actually text because yeah. it's, it's right. 
and you see this line in the middle of the green, uh, of the yellow block here, NVPTX non bin S. That's the PTX as summer actually, which most cases will come from an NVIDIA package in this sense. Well, well this, this assembler actually is, is a dumb program which does almost nothing uh, because uh, assembling the text file uh, basically preserves it, preserves it and, and just verifies it, it's, it's correct. And, but it, it has an option if, if the NVIDIA binary, uh, binary only program PTX AS is, is in the search path. It can actually use it and, and check check the assembly if it's if it's correct completely. So, yeah. And, and the linker also does not do much. It basically concatenates the different assembly files together into one thing. Yeah, yeah. So I suppose this is not some kind of cross compiling. It's splitting the program into. So if I have a, a code that must run in. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, well, the normal host code is, is compiled by the first CC1 in there, or, or, or second one, depends on, on which, which source code. You only have... Uh, that's, that's normal compilation. Yeah. And it, it just does an additional thing, it, it puts as, as a data section, the LTO uh, bytecode uh, of the routines and variables which are which need, need to be offloaded, and then then the linker plugin can actually make sure that get uh, assembled and linked if it needs to be and put into the uh, special data section of the binary. And the so the. The code which is prepared for offloading can be an entire function. It can be a subset of a function. This is, you have to look at the OpenMP and OpenMPC standards, how you're specifying these kind of things. And the, the thing is also that the, you said the, the code is for this and the rest is for the host. The host gets the entire code as well. So theory, theoretically, the, well, in practice also, the program can run without, in this case, an NVIDIA card on it. Yeah, will uh, just run at, slower. At, run, at runtime, what happens is that actually uh, the runtime library queries the hardware. Do I have any PTX hardware? Yes, I have three devices. Fine, I can use them. Or no, I don't have any. And in that case, there is a fallback. Uh, OpenMP actually allows to write uh, that a specific function will be offloading only or offloading only if it's this and this target yeah, and has then these and these select properties. the different de devices and, and, so and all kinds of things. But normally everything is, is uh, everything which needs to be offloaded is, is emitted twice, once for the host and once. So here we only uh, talked about uh, the compiler into invocation. We could draw a similar image for invoking a program which uses offloading and there you will also see that in the background all kinds of magic is going on. So, uh, as, as we had the slide with the, with the different interfaces, those are different kind of uh, languages. The preprocessor data is, is a way how to write preprocess uh, code in a, in, a, in a text file. And then another interface is, is the abstract syntax tree then we have different levels of, of middle end of uh, machine code, and then have some some machine code, uh, some some uh, intermediate language which which is close, much closer to the hardware RTL, and then assembler. So and all, and all of can generate lots exactly. Of so all of them can be emitted and can be inspected. Over the lifetime of the code through your compiler, you can look at all the intermediate steps, and we are going to look at these kind of things. This is oftentimes not that easy to actually understand, as you can see this. The compiler can also have submit some uh, summary reports of some form. Other compilers are admittedly a little bit better on some of these kind of things, but we are trying to work around this, and you will see later on I have a couple of examples of helpers programs, for instance, hyperscripts, which I wrote to actually make this easier.
So first, uh, we, we show something how to how you can record actually the swi uh, switches which which some uh, source code has been compiled with, and there are two options, or or there is also the Anobin plugin which 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 is the third option. Uh, with the uh, first option, it emits it emits a section which is uh, which has. Uh, different strings for, for each of the options and those strings are merged so, so I, I find this option actually quite unusable because it's then hard to find out which options uh, were used for which, kind, uh, which, which functions or which, uh, which parts of the binary blob. It depends a little bit on how you're programming things. If you have different, uh, very optimized with individual functions, getting different options and so on, yeah. This is not that useful, but this is very easy to add to your make file. Another one, uh, and that's, that's actually the default, uh, is, is the minus G uh, record, option, uh, record options, and that includes those options in the DWAT producer string in the debug information which has the advantage that in the debug information you can map this function is covered by this debug information uh, compile unit and that compile unit has been compiled with, with those and those options. So uh, this slide shows how you can pre-process C source code and <coughs> you just use the minus uh, uppercase E, and those lines starting with hashes uh, are about entering or leaving some, uh, some header file or source file or, or just moving, moving the location <coughs> by, by If it. blocks, et cetera, so these kind of, all the pre process stuff is gone except for this. This is recording. This, you could reconstruct from this the parts of the header file or source code of the file which the compiler actually sees. And this can be, in some situations, really helpful if you're using especially uh, header files from projects we are not, uh, not really familiar with. You have to find out what is actually I'm seeing, what kind of <laughs> macros have I defined to see that and that. So this is the, the output you're actually using for that. The magic numbers in there, the one, two, three, four, are about one is that you are entering a new header, two is that you are leaving some header, and three is uh, that that header is a system header, and four is uh, about implicit extern C for for C plus plus headers. Some headers are implicit extern C, and others are not. So you can also pre-process and ask that. Uh, that it dumps the macros which are, which are defined. You can use either DM or D w, uh, DD. And DM shows just the macros and DD shows the pre-processed file intermixed with, with the defined. Yeah. So yeah. This, this, yeah, this is something where you might not know about this, but the, the compiler environment specifically and so on is by itself defining, I don't know, 100, 200 macros all by itself, which are predefined when you're doing things. So you might be familiar with, with macros like, which indicate what kind of CPU you are using and so on, but there are many, many more as you can see this year, and especially when it comes to C++, as we can see on the next slide. Then uh, everyone here is, of course, a C++ developer using the latest standard and so on. You will know that there is a feature in the standard for ever since C++ 11, where you can query inside the source code which feature of the standard is actually available in the implementation. This is all done using macros. There, um, there is, well, the, the most important is underscore underscore C++, which tells you the uh, year and, uh, and month of the standard. And so you can ask whether, well, you can pre-process something depends, uh, depending on whether C++, uh, the current C++ standard is newer than C++ 14, for instance, or older than C++ 17, and so on. And uh, recent versions of C++ add many, many further macros for each small feature, 
which yeah. is there. So you don't have to have something like auto confidence on so configure scripts to determine does my compiler actually support this. You can put this code, the appropriate actions inside the, the, your source code. It can, also, can either be something like a static assert, saying, well, I don't compile without this feature, or it can be working around the missing of this feature. And uh, there's not an easy way, usually, to actually find out what my compiler actually supports. So this is why I have this, this script there, basically, so you can get, get this, basically. So you just run it to plus plus features, or you run it by specifying which standard version you're actually targeting. With that, you can find out all the features which are there, and you can rely on them, et cetera, and can work with them. This is just one way to actually how you can use this DM output. These are actually compiler predefined macros. Not uh, only that, also and, the library And the ones. library has also its own, but the, those, the library ones need you to include that header. Well, and, and this, this does it, so it does so. it for you, so. And the exact values also sometimes change, like in C++14 you can have one value and in C++20 another value. Uh, the, uh, those macros, uh, the standard definitions were for C++17 on the side in a separate document, as the, as the six, and in C++20 they were merged into the main standard. Yeah. So you can see there the, the, value, the minimum values and, and so on. Anyway, that's a nice way now so to, for the compiler to automatically advertise what it actually does and what it supports. And it's all done using macros. And this is uh, for, for, for instance, when, when uh, different compilers implement new features, they don't implement everything at, at one time. And, and because the, it takes three years for, for a new C++ version, then those three years can, can have different features one, can carry one by one. So. Now, get, now the fun starts. So. So this is just, just a very small, stupid example where I, I just wanted to show some, some features of the, of the dumps. Uh, GCC can use the fdump option where, where you select what kind of dumps you want, like three dumps or the Gimple dumps. IPA is about the inter procedural optimizations. RTL is, is the backend stuff. And, and the, the third, Third word in in that option is uh, which exact path are you interested in? So you can write f dump tree gimple for instance, and it dumps just one file. And if you write all, it dumps all of them. And there are many of them. As as you can see, there are 192 of them in, in this compilation for for this exact compiler version, and they are numbered so that you can see which pass is, is first and which pass is next. And there are some gaps because some passes are, uh, have, have some gates which, which depend on some options and so on. Some, some passes might not be invoked in this particular case, and in that case. And don't rely on the numbers and the names to always be the same. So between each compiler release or even and so on, these things may change. They might change in order. Some of them might go away, the other ones get added, et cetera. And you can see some numbers at the end, like DCE4. So some passes are um, multiple times at different pa uh, parts of, of the pass queue, and so they are numbered uh, depending on where they exactly appear. So we, propose, we promised you to get insight and compiler. Here you have it. So imagine your project with a thousand files for each of them, 192 files in addition to the output object file. So have fun. So uh, this is the first first tree dump, the original dump. That's that's the interface between the front end and and uh, the middle end, and that's actually still still part of the front end, late late in the front end, and so it uses. Uh, data structures which, which can be deeply nested. For instance, you can see those expressions in there. Uh, those are not normalized in any way. There are already some optimizations happening, as you can see, because in the source code there was two times x plus 12, and now you can see x plus six times two. Yeah. So some optimizations already happen at this level but most, most of them don't. 
what, what's kind of weird is that you see twice the declarations of the variable. That's because the first, first ones, the less indented ones, are just list, lists of the variables which are in the function. And those uh, more indented lines are the declaration statement, statements of the variables where, where the variables actually start living. And for, for most of the variables, that's where the actual assignments of, of the uh, initializer to the variable is. But uh, for instance, for, for VLAs and stuff like that, it matters even more because uh, the size of the variable is, uh, is decided at that point and so on. So this is what you want to see where, where you are looking for what, what comes from the front, front end. So this is what the compiler sees in the first place. And if you already have a mistake there, so if you make wrong assumptions, well, you know where to look for. So uh, as I said, the, uh, generally the front end trees, uh, well, there are different, <laughs> different front ends have different front end trees. But what you see in the original dump are, are the C, C++ ish trees, which, which most of the front ends emit as, as the interface to the middle end. Uh, the, the previous dump is immediately lowered at, at the start of the optimizations into uh, this form, which, which we call Gimple. Uh, initially, it was, it, it was still trees, but it had some, had some requirements, like uh, we don't allow deeply nested trees. We want just very simple uh, assignments, like uh, this is the uh, left value the, where, where you assigned two and it should have at most one, two, three, maybe four operands which are fixed for, for the particular operation for most of them, uh, one or two. And so you can see it lowered this way. Uh, there are no basic blocks at, at this point uh, and it's not in SSA form and but we already use some SSA names as, as temporaries, like you can see the underscore one in, in there, which is used just, just as, a, as a cheaper anonymous uh, integer variable in this case. Uh, and, and you can see all the gotos in, in there because there are no basic blocks at this point. So you see this is practically C code. And actually, uh, yeah, yeah, you can easily translate it by, by hand into, into C code if, if you want. Or there, there is an option for the dumps, like uh, where I, I, I said something about the first three words, but then, then there are options for the dumps and, and you can say like you want details or you want, uh, you want to modify the dump in a certain way. And there is a way how to produce something that, uh, that we have also another front end which, which can read these dumps and, and start from that. So you can pass something. Usually readable. not interested to use, so but for compiler developers, really nice. So, so for, for instance, for the, uh, for the ternary operator, you can see it creates temporary variables if temp dot zero and assigns the values in different uh, different parts of the code and then assigns the rest uh, result in, into the A variable. Speed up a bit. So uh, this is then lowered. The, this is actually dumped from, from the optimized dump, which is the last one in the, in the, in the middle end part. And here you can see basic blocks uh, uh, and it's in SSA form. So you can see the phi in there because in, in SSA form, we, we require that uh, every SSA name is assigned just once. So we need to solve the problem that uh, the same variable could have different values when coming from different, uh, different edges of the uh, control flow graph. And basic blocks just means that as one input, uh, one uh, in entry point into the block and one exit point. So if you have a jump somewhere in the middle there, so it, this breaks the basic block. And there can be multiple edges coming into the basic block and out of the basic block. 
you can have different properties. Uh, what you can see in this picture is as well uh, the debug statements, which say, for instance, at, the, at this point, the A variable is equal to this value. And uh, the source code contained also a variable which has been completely optimized out. There is nothing left, nothing needed for that. But in the debug information, we store that, how, how you can compute that optimized out variable and so can propagate it to the debug information. And the, the D uh, between the parents uh, is, uh, for, for a parameter, is, is it's the value passed to the parameter. And for other variables, it means uh, uninitialized value, like if you forgot to initialize some variable somewhere, then, then it's represented by the D as well. Well, that's something which a compiler de uh, developers actually are not using that much, which is something I added back in, I think, 97 it was. We can actually have a graphical output as this as well of the compiler's intermediate stages and so on. So this is the equivalent of what we have seen before in textual form, now in a nice graphical form. So nowadays we are emitting this in the dot format. For that, we have all kinds of front ends here for, for the presentation. I transferred this into SVG format, but using X dot, you can actually display it graphically on the screen. And for those who are, if you really want to follow this, you can see this here now, really nicely represented in the sense, especially also you see this here, the probabilities of the, of the individual uh, edges the compiler will assume in this case. Yeah, in this case, the probabilities it's can be either guessed by the compiler using some heuristics, depending on, yeah, this compares some variable to some exact value, so it's, it's more likely that it's some another value than this exact one or the loop. Yeah. Usually loops and, and doesn't break and, and so on. But uh, the, the counters can be also uh, uh, recorded from, from the profile guided. Uh, yeah. Or you can use what's called built-in expect, that's a compiler feature, or nowadays in C++ standard, likely, unlikely, and so on. So, which means that if you're looking at this and you disagree with the probabilities, you can actually do something about that. And uh, we then have a completely different uh, language which describes, uh, which, which the optimized dump I, I showed before is then lowered to, to this form where you have each, each uh, machine instruction usually written in, in one, one RTL instruction and all the occurrence and there are de details about this is this register and so on. Uh, it has still several different forms. Uh, in, uh, before register allocation for different uh, values, we, we use the pseudo registers which then the register allocator allocates either to some registers or to, to memory. And the, and this is quite late dump, so it, it shows, uh, shows all the, it, it's after the register allocation. So basically this is the pseudo uh, machine code representation. So this is very much something which can be directly mapped to what a machine can actually execute. And actually, uh, some, some architectures have very weird assembler like S390 and so on. They use those single or two letter uh, mnemonics and I usually just read uh, the dumps which are more readable to me and explain what the instruction actually does. And uh, this slide shows for, for a particular instruction, the compare SE1, uh, how how it's actually written in the machine description. We have a language which allows you to describe in this RTL language uh, the properties of the instruction. So we say for this instruction that it sets the flux register, which, which is the machine register which contains uh, the results of the comparison. Or in uh, 386, it's modified by most of the instructions and sets it to a comparison of one operator, uh, one operand and another operand. Uh, there, uh, there are predicates for, for those which are usually used before the register allocation and which require like 
non-immediate operand says it can be immediate value, but so it has to be a register or or a memory. And in this, the last string in there are are the constraints. That's something you can also use in uh, in the inline assembly. And you say so this register uh, this this value needs to be pushed into this kind of class of register or memory and so on. So the thirty last line is the actually assembly code. Well, it gets constructed from the actual assembly code. As, as Jakob said before, GCC emits, at least in a, in, a, in a moment, a textual file. This is the string from which it is there. So this mode suffix, forget about this, is simply there. the registers can be used in 8 bits and 16 bits, 30 bits, 64 uh, bits. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, the square, uh, the angled brackets are about uh, macroization. We use this actually instruction for multiple different mode sizes, so for 8 bits. Otherwise, we would have to have so four on. different and versions so, of that. So that's, that's in order to simplify it. And uh, the, rest and the curly, curly brackets in there are also that we support multiple different uh, kind of assemblies. And so for Intel assembly, there is one order of arguments. And AT and T, the other one. So but uh, see, with this, what you can also see is how actually a compiler generates code. It has all these patterns and it has to match them to this representation of the program, which you see here on the right, uh, left-hand side. And by using the different patterns and so on, optimal and so on, it has to cover the entire representation of the program. Once it has that, it just can concatenate the appropriate pattern and has code. It's and that simple, compilers and are trivial. On these patterns, you can do stuff like, uh, like the compiler, which just tries to propagate uh, the RTL of, of the operands into, into further instructions and tries to match it. And if it matches, then it has a new instruction that can do more magic. Yeah, we have special optimizations, even at that level, people optimizations, which can do specifically compiler or architecture specific and CPU specific things. So anyone knows 68K assembly? Where? There's a special processor and so on. It has a special mode where you access a variable and increments it. Well, it's very late. You put this in a people optimization and it takes advantage of this. That's not something you want to do in a compiler in general because it's the only machine with this. So, so we already talked about the SSA form. So let's, let's skip it. This is 68K was this specific thing only. But uh, this is where they had some of this thing thought of how to use this, but I think 68 was the only one which actually implemented this. But it doesn't matter. So there, there's simply features in, in processes which are specific to individual ones and so on. And we can take advantage of them by using these kind of rules. So on this slide, I want to show a small part, a small function uh, abstracted from, from the spec benchmark from one, one of the spec benchmarks which, which contains undefined behavior. That's, that's the uh, statement with yellow in there because if, it's, uh, if it reads, uh, if it uh, uh, loops over all the 16 iterations, it, it uh, dereferences uh, the array at, at D16, which is after the end of, of the array and that's undefined behavior in, in C and C++. Uh, spec actually refused to fix it. And, uh, what actually is in, in, in the spec is, is, is the function without the if. So uh, we changed the compiler so that in those cases where, where the user writes these loops exactly 16 times and there's, there's no early exit, in that case we just warn that it's, it, it invokes undefined behavior in the 16th iteration and, and, and stop doing anything. But uh, if it's not, uh, if there is an uh, early break, uh, then, then the program itself uh, is not necessarily invalid. It's only invalid if, if uh, the sum of the values up to, up to that point is not 512. So here I want to f show you uh, which optimizations actually change the behavior of this, of this uh, small program. You can look at the, uh, that's the last dump. 
and you can see there is there is no comparison of of of, of the uh, loop iterator against six, uh, sixteen. But if you look at, at some early pass, you see it in there. So there is the comparison of k is is k equal or less or equal to fifteen. Yeah. So so we. Uh, so we can grab uh, which, which path was the last one which, which had this statement in, in there. And look at the next dump and what's going on in there. And that's the VRP dump, the early VRP. And it shows all the inter in interesting information in there that uh, we are analyzing the number of iterations of the loop, find out that there would be an uh, undefined behavior if it's iterated more than, than 15 times. And in that case, decide that the number of iterations must be uh, below this number and propagates through that into the value ranges. And then we, we see this comparison if k, k underscore five uh, is, is smaller or equal to 15. And we have a value range for, for that uh, SSA name and that's zero to 15. So this statement is always true. So we optimize it out. And we get a, uh, an infinite loop because of that. But that's only because the program was invalid. And that's, of course, you see, uh, especially uh, the security folks saying that the compiler should not do these optimizations. <laughs> but you're telling the compiler to do that. You're telling it to optimize according to the rules of what you're putting in there. And the compiler doesn't know anything else. It the, only sees the code which The compiler is. actually is not trying to do uh, any harm. It, it just tries to uh, use, the, uh, use the assumption that the, pro, uh, the code being compiled is valid. And it, it will do something reasonable. This is another case, another test case, where, as you can see, uh, the programmer probably would expect that it, it, it has an infinite loop. But uh, what, when you actually run this, it's not an infinite loop when you compiled by the recent GCC, but it, it, it will crash. And that's because you can find out that in the VRP, again, we are finding out that the dereference of the P pointer is done only if the pointer is equal to null. So it changes. Uh, explicitly to, to reading from the null pointer. And later on, you can see that other pass is making this assumption, assume loop one to be finite, because the C++ uh, and C standards have, uh, have a requirement that, that programs actually make progress. Uh, and in, in infinite loops are actually not valid in C and C++. Uh, GCC actually, if it's, norm, uh, it's normal uh, infinite loop without any exits, then GCC no, does not optimize it out. But, but if it's a, in a loop which, which has some exit, then it assumes it, it must be finite. And in that case, it removes the loop and it just reference now and that's why it crashes. And with this, you can find out what you have to do also to restore the behavior in case the compiler misunderstands you. You have to then follow the rules in which, uh, uh, in which you can do that. So, so we're almost there. So um, let me go very quickly now. So the compiler has lots and lots of features and so on and options and so on. So you can have the dash dash help option, which gets you uh, generic information and so on. You can break it down to actually get options for about specific topics. And just here you can see we have a loan for the optimizer 243 options there and for for the parameters these are things which you can set a, compile, a command line to influence some way the compiler is behaving there's another 221 of them so the, the major difference between parameters and normal options is that we actually don't guarantee that the parameters will be preserved in future versions exactly so. Options usually. so there are tons of things which you can influence and well we're not really here to tell you about everything. Uh, as, I, as I said, most, most of the passes in the compiler have some gates, and uh, what's often present in those gates is checking some options. Yeah. So what you can see is on the next slide, so you see there's, there's another script of mine which I wrote at some point which you can use. This will tell you, for instance, which of the options 
without gates and so on. So which of the options can be, are, are used probably for the different O levels and so on, optimization levels. You can select them individually still, but by just using the O options and so on, you can see then that some of them get turned on the higher the optimization level is. So this is just a subset of them. So this scrolls. It's quite long. And uh, another option of, of the three dumps is missed, which, which shows messages about which optimizations weren't made actually because some reason it, it tries to show the reason. But unfortunately, we don't do it for, for too many things. It's it unfortunately, at the moment. So this, stuff. this is work in progress, but again, so this is also a little bit harder to see. So next slide. So uh, well, uh, you can, we can actually save the information in a, in a JSON file. This is so one of our colleagues wrote this option, F safe optimization records. It looks like this. This is completely unusable. So, so I wrote yet another script. So next slide. So, which you can get there. So, this you, you point to the JSON file, which is the compiler is emitting, and it will show you code li output like this, which actually is injecting the appropriate messages, which you see there, intermingling it with the source code and so on, and says then things like that. So, what are the appropriate messages? So, we don't claim that this is complete in any way or form. Uh, this is something where, if you're interested in compilers, you can easily make progress very, very quickly yourself. So just get that and make sure that we are emitting more and more of these useful messages in all the different places. Yeah. And this sh just shows what, what the compiler actually produces. Yeah, so because it doesn't pro produce object files, so it produces text files. Yeah, so we are doing these kind of things, and, and this is a complete representation, and this is something which the external program can can handle. Which, in theory, you could insert your own step between assembly generation and assembly and generating object files, transform this, or collect additional information out of this. And if you want to get more information, you can uh, use the. See at the top there for both SM, so it, it emits a couple of additional pieces of information there, so you can actually trace it back to where it comes from in the in the source code, etc. Uh, if you emit debug information, those information are usually present in there as well through the dot line, but the, uh, with, with the, for it's both harder to read. ASM, it, it's much easier to read. Yeah. There is another option minus a DP, which allows you to intermix the. RTL of each instruction together with, with, the, with the actual assembly. All right, I guess this, I think this was the last one. So um, just a little bit of an overview. So compilers are scary, they're big pieces, but it's not unmanageable. You can actually look into them. So are there any questions you want to ask? Well, we work on GCC, so C yeah, line doesn't exist. It's not. No, it doesn't have to be. So, uh, no. Yeah, it's 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 not uh, sufficient enough speed up that it matters. It's not. Like, it's really, it's like, well, you need to have very small, uh, very very slow file system. Like on on Windows, perhaps it would matter much more. Where the file system is really it's slow. It's quite honestly not that but much anymore. Especially so. if it's uh, slash temp, uh, which, which is which is a memory backed file system. Exactly. It just so doesn't matter. I have a question, which is probably a little bit wrong. Uh, can I re reach somewhere of that uh, presentation? Which is well, the presentations will at some point later on be right. made available through the websites, whatever this is, so they will be collected. But also, I will prop put this up on my, my server at some point. So you usually always do, yeah. The implication earlier, when you called GCC or G++, is that um, it's generating one object file for each source file sequentially. Is that not parallelized? Or is that something well, that's that what I meant or? before. Yeah, that's, that's sequential. This is yes. why you're not doing putting them on the same command line. So well, except, ex except for LTO. In yeah. the LTO case, there is you compile the files and then you do the linking and the linking would take too long if it if it wasn't paralyzed and that's why it splits it, uh, the work into smaller partitions these are the related functions which which need to be optimized together and, and 
for instance, it, it finds like for Firefox, it can use. But this several, only several several. This only things. works because it can work Partition. with Make together. So yeah. by using the Make server, you can guarantee that the machine is not completely overloading. Otherwise, we would have to add this, but there's no need to do this because you can com invoke the compiler multiple times, and then you have complete control over this. Like, like I think in the default building of, uh, of LLVM, uh, the default is to use LTO, but with, without any kind of locking, any, any kind of parallelization, and at that point, you ra just run out, out of memory. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just a bad idea. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>